thinking. Good morning, I'm pleased to talk about critical thinking in clinical medicine. And really the main point is that it's important to think about thinking. It's important to consider how we make judgments, how we manage perceptions, how we reach conclusions, and not depend only on automatic processing and automatic thinking pathways. Uh, I could also title this talk, 25 Lessons on Critical Thinking in Medicine. I thought it's, it's good to break up my ideas into different categories and different examples. And uh, I look forward to your questions when I'm finished at the end of my talk. Uh, to some degree, this talk came from the early days when I arrived in Louisville when I was given the responsibility of giving a one hour introduction to neurology to medical students. And I thought, what could I possibly say in one hour? Neurology has a lot of facts, a lot of things are going on, and a lot of things I could say, what is it that is most important for them to know? And I thought, that among the most important things would be awareness of how they think. I'm pleased to acknowledge the contribution of my collaborators shown in this slide, and also these agencies, individuals, and foundations that have supported my research. And this is the code for getting CME credit. For my first lesson, I'd like to tell the story about Janet Woodcock. So she's the principal deputy commissioner of the FDA. I think she has recently stepped down. But she was responsible for approving the Alzheimer monoclonal antibody, aducanumab, which was approved by the FDA on June 7th, 2021. Uh, she and, the, and her colleagues they approved this drug even though it had been recommended for rejection by the FDA's Scientific Advisory Committee by a vote of 10 to 1, 10 to 1 against approval. But they approved it, said Woodcock, because we need a totality of evidence approach. There shouldn't be just one way to approve drugs. She said fundamentally, the 50-year investment in basic science has to merge with clinical methodology. And this is my highlight there in red. We have to stop. Just stop thinking. Empirical evaluation is the only way of evaluating truth. And when I read this, I was really shocked that, is there something wrong with empirical evaluation? The fact about this drug is that the, its efficacy is minimal in regard to improving the cognition or the cognitive deterioration in these patients. It does remove the amyloid beta protein from the brain, but it doesn't help the patient. And she is saying that we should approve the drug even though it doesn't help the patient because it, it helps the biomarker. So if we look up this word, Empirical is based on or concerned with verifiable by observation or experience. And is there something wrong with that? I mean, where did she get the right to re revert to 3,000 years ago who, and Plato, who said all knowledge could be obtained through pure reasoning, and we didn't actually have to go out and measure anything? So my point here in the first lesson is we shouldn't lose sight of the patient for the data. We shouldn't pay more attention to like uh, a biomarker than what really matters, which is the patient's experience. And there are innumerable examples here, but if a, if a person has streptococcal pharyngitis, and they have a fever and pain in their throat. If you give them aspirin, the pain will be relieved and the fever will go down. 
but you haven't treated the infection. So certainly you wouldn't say that aspirin is an effective treatment for streptococcal pharyngitis. Uh, for lesson two, consider what does a neurologist have to know? And we all know there are 12 cranial nerves. We know what the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is and how to read the EEG. But I propose that these things can all be learned from books. What can't be learned from books is how to pay attention to patients and how to make judgments about what's wrong. How to be aware of how you think and perceive and how, how we learn. Critical thinking is a rigorous type of thinking that involves making fair and careful judgments. And there are many forms of bias and other perceptual problems which can interfere with our rational uh, thinking process. And the general goal is to be aware of thinking. So the goal is not necessarily to be, become smarter and more knowledgeable, which is, of course, good. But part of that is to be aware of how you think and to pay attention to the process of reasoning and to be aware of what's happening. So bias, as I will discuss in a moment, is an enormous issue here. And the goal is not necessarily to remove all forms of bias because that's basically not possible. But what's necessary is to be aware of how bias could interfere with your, our perceptions and reasoning. Lesson three is uh, William James who said, experience is not the same as what happens to you. Experience is what you pay attention to what happens to you. He gave the example of a pack of dogs let loose in the British Museum in, Muse in London. If you leave them there for a year, they would not learn anything about art. They would experience the art, but they wouldn't pay attention to the art. William James also said, the art of being wise is knowing what to overlook. And this is a large part of the process of getting experience in clinical medicine, not only do we know what to pay attention to, we know what to overlook. And it's important that we are aware of this process of overlooking, because it is a very important uh, aspect of our judgment and observation. What really matters is our attention. And if we pay attention to things that are not important, our judgment will be impaired. So here's a snake in, the, in Japan, but if you pay attention to the image a bit, you'll see there are actually two snakes, one hiding under the, under the uh, log and one on top. But if you're gonna look for the snake, if you pay selective attention to factors in the environment which might indicate where the snake is, uh, of course that would impact your perception. The key aspect about perception is this. We don't see the world the way it really is. And this is important for us to understand when we see patients, when we are aware of how we interact with them, how we perceive what happens, how we're colored by our previous or our preconceived ideas. But the world is too complicated to perceive it directly, to perceive everything that's in it. And this is just an example. This heron in Kyoto, now I'm hearing a, an echo, okay. Uh, and the, the word heron in, in Japanese is sagi. This sagi is not perceiving the world completely. It's not looking at the colors of the green leaves. It's not anticipating or it's not maybe noting the flowers which might be coming out. It's looking for fish. So its nervous system is devoted to movement in a very sensitive 
manner. Similarly, when we interact with a patient, we can't process everything, like which of the uh, toenails is longest, uh, how much hair is on the back of the, of the shoulder of, this, of a male patient. We have to uh, focus our attention and our senses evolved because of their necessity and enhancement of our survival. So things that don't enhance our survival are not happening. Our perceptual mechanisms are influenced by evolution to help us to survive. And that does not involve paying attention or seeing the world the way it really is. An example of this is, if you look and see what the next slide shows, please read the next slide. And if you can think to yourself what it said, I'll do it again. Uh, a common observation is people see this and they say it says Paris in the spring. But it actually says Paris in the, the spring. The reason it's misperceived commonly is that uh, the two, uh, the appearance of two articles, the, the, never happens in English. So we're not prepared for that. So our perceptual mechanisms, not only for language or for writing, but for words and for listening and experiencing is based on expectations. So if I say, Linda went to the library and came home with a new book. Before I said the word book, you thought unconsciously that's what I was going to say. I wasn't going to say Linda came home from the library with a new lizard. It's possible, but it's unlikely. So our perceptions are based on our expectations, which are largely unconscious. And awareness of this is important for medicine. Lesson five, listening to the patient is very important. They're trying to tell us what's the matter with them. And it's best, if possible, to practice deep listening, which involves listening completely and not preparing to speak. This is a big problem nowadays when everybody is pressured to see patients faster and faster because this, this process like deep listening cannot happen if you don't have enough time. So when you listen to the patient, you're not preparing to ask them the next question. And the best thing then is to repeat back to the patient, oh, I understand you think this, this is what you observe this, and you, re you e re repeat back what you believe they said, so you can verify if you understood it properly. One example here of listening to the patient is this, uh, my only publication in the New England Journal, a patient with a distal ulnar neuropathy, and we did an MRI, I mean, a, EMG, and could not find any reason why this healthy 28-year-old man had this ulnar neuropathy. He didn't have diabetes, and he didn't have any trauma that we know of. But I asked him at the end of, an, of a visit, did he have any theory about why he had it? And he said that he was uh, obsessed with playing a video game, which involved rub, rub, rubbing his hand into a rotating ball and he was playing it all day long. And we were able to demonstrate that that was the cause of his neuropathy. But we only learned this by asking. And uh, it's, it's the best approach is to assume that the patient is telling you what's the matter, but we have to listen. Another important aspect of listening is uh, obtaining the story that the patient has to tell. Uh, listen, lesson number six. The evolutionary approach here, the evolutionary aspect of this is the human brain evolved a capacity for appreciation of stories. 
50,000 years ago, our ancestors could not transmit information through books or video games or videos, of course. So understanding and appreciating stories was very important. So this is why there's so many movies, why there's so many books, why stories are so valued in our cultures. Uh, but this is a deeply ingrained, evolutionarily advantaged system. So evolution enhanced the capacity of the brain to appreciate stories. And we learn better from stories. And each patient is a story. Uh, according to uh, Toshikawa, who I met in Kyoto, every time I see a new patient, I read a new book. So we honor the patient by learning about their stories. And we dishonor the patient by not showing an interest in what the story is they have to tell. Also, we all learn better when we make our patient experiences into a story. And we make our learning into stories. Moving on to lesson seven, there are many forms of bias. Again, uh, there are more for, these are not all the forms of bias, these are just a few. But this inter, interacts with our ability to understand what's going on. And I am not implying that we can remove these biases, just that by being aware of them, we can uh, lessen their damaging effect on our perception and judgment. Particularly important in medicine here is a framing bias that if you tell a medical student that this patient has myasthenia, would you go examine this patient with myasthenia, that you're depriving them of the opportunity to figure out what's going wrong. Even if you, uh, uh, if you have a new patient and uh, they're referred by someone who thinks they have uh, some disease, you need to be aware of the fact that this framing bias could influence your judgment because let's say they came from the Mayo Clinic and they thought they had uh, neuromyelitis optica. Maybe the Mayo Clinic was right, Mayo, maybe the Mayo Clinic was not right. But you will likely to be biased by this framing bias and awareness of this could help make a better judgment. This is particularly true in patients in clinic who are carried on in the clinic for years and years and years and years with the same diagnosis, which could turn out to be incorrect, just because nobody thought about it. They just assume that the diagnosis in the chart is what's going on. And it's known to all of us that it's our responsibility at each visit to reconsider what people have thought in the past to see if that's correct. Uh, I saw a patient in the VA years ago who had congenital nystagmus. So it didn't interfere very much with his visual processing, but his eyes looked like there was something really wrong with it if you didn't know about congenital nystagmus. And at the VA, uh, 20 years earlier, he had been diagnosed with MS because some but he thought that that eye movement abnormality indicated he had MS. So he was on full disability and he was seen in the neurology clinic in the VA in California for over 20 years, carried with this incorrect diagnosis, nobody having thought about what was the matter with him. We all have preconceived ideas which can influence our judgment. Some people or many people have a bias into thinking only common things are what happened, and that rare things don't happen. I've known other physicians who like to see every patient and to think of the rarest possible thing that could happen and have a bias in that way. Uh, bias of lost actors is also called survivorship bias. And that is we often don't have, we don't have input from people who haven't survived. And uh, 
this is important to consider. Uh, I have thought if uh, if people who died in, let's say, mountain climbing accidents, if they could write books, people would be less eager to go mountain climbing because all the books about mountain climbing adventures end up with the person who wrote the book living and writing the book. But you never, they, they may talk about, oh, it was very sad on this date, so-and-so died. But then it, the whole trip was really fun. Uh, experimental bias is quite important, also called researcher bias. And this is that if the uh, researcher has a certain result they want, they can consciously or unconsciously bias the results. This has been shown in studies uh, of learning in rats that if you give genetically identical rats to different groups of students and tell one group that, oh, these are very smart rats, and then another group, these are very uh, stupid rats, and measure their performance, the performance will be, measurements will be biased by the researchers' expectations, even if the performance of the rats is measured uh, electronically. So somehow the bias in the experimenters gets transmitted to the animals. Implicit bias or social cognition bias involves associations of outside conscious awareness that lead to neg negative evaluation of a person based on irrelevant characteristics such as race or gender. And again, uh, the, the idea is to be aware of this, which helps us make better judgments. In regard to this implicit bias, which is widespread and, um, of course, the sub subject of many other talks, uh, I'm kind of proud of Alzheimer. Alzheimer was a Bavarian neuropsychologist, a Bavarian neuropsychiatrist who died in 1915, having reported in 1907 the feature of a 55-year-old patient who had amyloid plaques in the brain. But around that time, or maybe around 1900, Solomon Carter Fuller came to work for Alzheimer. He was an African-American who was born in Liberia and then studied psychiatry and neurology in Boston. And he realized that he uh, didn't know much about neuropathology, even though he was examining brains from a mental hospital. He decided where to go, and he went to work for Alzheimer in Munich. The story was Alzheimer interviewed four people for this job in Munich, three Germans and one African-American from Boston, and he chose uh, Solomon Carter Fuller, who went on to write some of, who wrote some of the most important of Alzheimer's papers and published the most, uh, uh, the first paper of Alzheimer's with figures in 1910. Uh, he went on to live in Boston, make important contributions to psychiatry, and there's now a building named after him at Boston University Medical School. This is the paper Rosenthal and Lawson about bias affecting the results of learning in rats. We did a paper on intracranial calcification in dementia based on the size of pineal and corpus and um, other calcifications in the brain in Alzheimer patients. But we didn't want to be biased by the appearance of, by knowing who had Alzheimer and who didn't. And if we looked at a CT scan, we can tell perhaps based on atrophy. So I didn't want my judgment to be biased by the presence of atrophy or the absence of atrophy. So I had other people make a uh, fielding system so that when we looked at the intracranial calcifications, 
we could only see that, we couldn't see the cortex. So at least in theory, I wouldn't be biased by something uh, which would tell me which patient group was present. Uh, this kind of experimental bias also gets to be very important when you consider that the uh, academic promotion of many people in research is dependent upon their research productivity. So I was uh, in my laboratory in at NIH, the director wanted to do a certain study and he assigned a postdoc to do it and the postdoc did it, it took him two years and he didn't get the results my boss wanted. So my boss said, do it over. And he said, but it took me two years. And the boss said, I don't care, I'm, I don't, I'm not in any hurry. And not surprising, the postdoctoral fellow who was doing this went and did it over, but this time he managed to do it in only six months and he got the result that the boss wanted. Uh, lesson eight is it's important to pay attention to the assumptions in this, in the diagnostic testing and research evaluations. The best example may be that uh, the mistake that I believe Woodcock made at the FDA was she's assuming the biomarker is the same as the disease, and it's not. Also, my laboratory at the National Institute of Aging, before I got there, did a PET study showing brain metabolism was reduced in Down syndrome. It turned out that this is wrong because they didn't consider the fact that patients with Downs have smaller brains and thicker skulls, so that there was more uh, blockage of the radiation in their brain, in, from the cortex to the de detectors. And the whole study published in Science was a mistake. Uh, lesson nine, it's important to remember we are responsible for caring for the patient. Often we assume that, uh, particularly if the patient is cognitively impaired or otherwise uh, not able to make the best judgments, that we are now responsible for the family. And we need to remember that the family may not have the best interests of the patient in mind. Of course, most of the time, the family does, and it can be very hard for us to figure, figure out whose interests they are honoring. But this is, again, just something to be aware of, which we uh, might not often consider. The most tragic example of this is uh, Dr. Autumn Klein, who was a neurologist in Philadelphia who was killed by her husband, Robert Ferrante. He, he claims to be innocent, but he's in prison sentenced to, uh, uh, found guilty of murder. He supposedly he killed her with cyanide. He was also a scientist, and he had cyanide in his laboratory. So if you do have a, a ill patient, it it is something to uh, keep in mind that this kind of horrible thing can happen. Furthermore, it's important that we remember that cognitive function is relevant for all of, of medicine. Imagine a patient who has cancer of the prostate and has to choose between which of these therapies they want. If they're not capable of understanding the difference between robotic and radiation and open surgery and heating and so on, they shouldn't be making such a decision. Unfortunately, I imagine urologists really don't know how to measure cognitive function, but it is something they uh, need to be aware of. 
We need to avoid intellectualization, which is using reason and logic to avoid uncomfortable anxiety-provoking emotions. Don't use thinking to avoid feeling. My story here was Melvin Yar, who was my chair at one time at Mount Sinai. We went to see a patient who uh, had had headache and seizures, a 40-year-old woman. And he came in to see her, and she said, after having an angiogram, and he came in and she said, won't you please sit down, Dr. Yar? And he said, no, thank you, I'm fine. And then he put his hand on her shoulder and said, the angiogram showed you have a brain tumor and the neurosurgeon will be here in a few hours. And she started sobbing. And he left the room with the residents and told us in the hall, notice the pseudobulbar palsy. That is emotional incontinence. And he was unable to recognize that she was a human being, even though she had a brain tumor, she was still a human being and capable of being sad to hear that she had a brain tumor. This was intellectualization in a most extreme, unfeeling and uh, unacceptable dimension. Lesson nine is we need to think deeply. So if this man fell and hit his head and comes to the hospital, okay, we need to do a CT or MRI scan. We need to see if there's bleeding or fracture. We need to assess his neurological function. But I've asked this question of many medical students, both here in Louisville and in Kyoto, and it's, it's disturbing, many of them don't understand that that's, this is not the whole story. We want to know why did he fall? We have to know why did he fall? Maybe he has a little dog who runs around like a, like a mouse all the time and he tripped over the little dog and we send him back home with the little dog and he's going to fall again. And these other reasons for falling, which are incomplete. But if we don't consider this question, uh, we may not be doing the best for this patient. Where exactly is the end of chemistry and the beginning of physics? So language is not simply a device for reporting experience, but a way of defining experience. And we can't avoid using language, but we have to understand how language influences, influences our thought. This favorite example of mine is the phrase rule out. We, there is no time, there is no place for us to use this because when we really mean, when we say rule out, we mean did not show evidence of. So, a normal chest x-ray does not rule out the possibility that the patient has pneumonia. We can say the chest x-ray did not support the diagnosis of pneumonia, or the chest x-ray was normal, which does not mean that the patient doesn't have pneumonia. It means it's less likely. But rule out means to exclude, eliminate, or to make impossible. So if I was or as I am right now in this room, I can say my examination of the room rules out the possibility there's an elephant in here. Uh, I know that it's absolutely, completely impossible because I looked under the desk, I looked in the closet and there is no elephant. I'm certain. But in, um, if you have a patient with a headache and you do a spinal tap and you don't find any bleeding, that does not rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage because in some patients it takes a while for the blood to get from the brain to the lumbar space. So a normal spinal tap does not support the presence of a subarachnoid hemorrhage and it suggests that there was not a subarachnoid hemorrhage but it does not rule it out and um, even though we know what is meant when people say rule out, 
I'm concerned that it will unconsciously imply that we can go ahead and forget about the possibility of these other things which should remain as possibilities. Uh, I'm sorry, having a virtual talk makes it difficult to have interactions, but I've asked many people this question, and almost everybody says, uh, rare events occur rarely, and that's actually not correct. What we need is, what we mean is specific rare events occur rarely. So on the left is hail, two to three centimeters in diameter. This is a rare event. I've never experienced hail this big. So this is a rare event. The cherry blossom, Sakura tree on the right, is commonly seen. However, if you were to study the anatomy of this tree in its three-dimensional complexity, you would see that this tree has never existed before in that way. And there is no other tree in the world that is absolutely identical to it. So this tree is also a rare event. Actually, everything that happens is a rare event. Specific rare events are rare, but every event is a rare event because every event is unique. Everything that happens is a rare event. Therefore, all patients are unique. Or it can be said, um, the disease is common, the patient is unique. Lesson 14, this is involved with the, uh, the bias in favor of rare diseases or bias in favor of common diseases. It just needs to be considered what the probability is. Rare presentations of common events are more common than the common presentations of rare events. So theoretically, if you had 100,000 people over 65, about more than 10,000 would have Alzheimer's disease. If you had 100,000 people over 65, only one-tenth of a person would have Kreutzfeldt because Kreutzfeldt is about one per million. And this is only to say that if there was a, comp a form of Alzheimer which is present in 1% of the cases, there'd be 100 people in that population of 100,000 who have that rare form of Alzheimer's disease and only one-tenth of a person with Kreutzfeldt. This doesn't mean that the person doesn't have Kreutzfeldt, just that, just that you need to consider uh, rare things rare presentations of common events because they're more common than common presentations of rare events. I have a, a Department of Defense grant I wrote a few years ago which was, received very good reviews, but the problem was one of the reviewers didn't like the fact that I was studying Parkinson's disease in mice. And of course, studying Parkinson's disease in mice is not my idea. It's been going on now for many years. And they are right that all models are wrong. However, the most important part here is some can be useful. How wrong do they have to be to be not useful? Uh, the work I was proposing by giving potentially pathogenic bacteria could not be done in humans <coughs> for obvious reasons. So models need to be understood for their limitations. The most, uh, we need to be aware of uh, that our interest is basically on in uh, humans, but if we can learn something from models because of their usefulness, uh, we need to do that. Uh, Floyd Bernard, who had a lot to say about 
scientific reasoning and wrote a wonderful book, Introduction to Clinical Medicine, around 1865, which is for sale by Dover Press in a reprint in English for like $8. He said, among other things, theories are not true or false, they are fertile or sterile. And when you think about it, it's remarkable how many examples of this are, there are. Perhaps my favorite one is uh, Columbus, who thought he was going to the west, to the east, and he was wrong. But the discovery of the New World, or at least his voyage to the New World, was kind of an interesting, important thing, even though he was wrong. Uh, Post-it notes are another example of the scientists at, at 3M company wanted to get a new glue, and they were working on a new formula, and they ended up with this very weak glue, which is what we use. Everybody, every one of us probably has some post-it notes on their desk. It's the largest selling product of this company, and it came out of a failed research project to develop a new glue. Lesson number 17. Smart people make mistakes. There's kind of an assumption, certainly when I was younger, I thought everybody who's a professor knows a lot and they would not, not do something really, really stupid or not have an opinion or not have a judgment or conclusion, which is wrong. So Galileo was asked about tides and whether tides were caused by the gravitational pull of the moon. And he said no. And he was very smart. Uh, I didn't know him myself, but I'm assuming he was very smart when you think about what he did. But he was wrong. Uh, at Duke, this young woman died because a heart transplant was given to her and nobody remembered to check the blood type. This is an incredibly important principle in critical thinking. We kind of assume certain mistakes are so horrible and so obvious that it won't happen. A better judgment is that whatever humans do can be done wrong. Even if it is very simple and even if it, the result is very tragic. There's also a neurosurgeon who had worked at Hopkins at one time who operated on the wrong side of a patient's head twice. Next, it's important to say when you don't know something. Uh, it's a very serious error to have the wrong diagnosis when really a better judgment would have been to not know. And uh, my own training was with Morris Bender, who was a great neurologist, who often said he didn't know. And uh, he had an enormous clinical experience, and if he couldn't m make a proper diagnosis, he would say immediately, he'd say, you know, I don't know. I don't know. And sometimes he'd say, I'm just a boy. He was replaced by Melvin Yar, who was a Parkinson's specialist, who never said, I don't know. He had a diagnosis for every patient, no matter how complex. He was often wrong, but he was never in doubt. Another example here is if I had a patient who had uh, a stroke who was 70 years old, who had hypertension, smoking, obesity, physical inactivity, and hyperlipidemia. And he had a stroke, and people said, if you were asked, why did he have a stroke? And they'd say, well, uh, he had a stroke because he has hypertension, hyperlipidemia, smoking, obesity, and physical inactivity. But what if he said, oh, what about my brother? He's 80. He smokes more than I do. He's more heavy than I am. And he's never had a stroke. How is that possible? So we shouldn't assume risk factors are causative. There must be something else. And the more honest answer about this is to say, I don't know.
And to say you don't know is leads to further th thought. To say that you know when you're not really right leads to the cessation of thought. Lesson 19 uh, is based on this quote that the greatest obstacle to discovery is the illusion of knowledge. Barry Marshall, along with a colleague, won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2005, showing that peptic ulcer disease can be caused by bacteria. He nearly lost his job and had grants rejected and had trouble getting published because he was thought to be an idiot because he didn't know that bacteria can't live in the stomach. I mean, this sounds, it sounds kind of ridiculous from the context of uh, 2022, but in the 70s and 80s, it was just thought to be obvious that bacteria can't live in the stomach. And that was wrong. So it's a great challenge to us today to imagine what is it that we've learned. And uh, we could go on and on about this, but just last month there were papers about the presence in the superior sagittal sinus and with the lymphatic system of the brain of a hub for the immune system to exchange molecules with antigen, antigen presenting cells and T cells inside the brain. This was shown to be impossible in research done at NIH in the 70s and 80s where it was found that the brain is immunologically privileged. It turns out that this, at least in large part, is a mistake. And of course, this is important for MS and for many other conditions. Uh, getting near the conclusion, uh, Paul Feyerabend was a philosopher of science in Berkeley and wrote of many, several important books. This is a remarkably important conclusion that is clinically and scientifically relevant. That is, if you have a theory about something and there's evidence for it and there's evidence against it, the evidence which is against it could mean that you're wrong. It could be that the evidence against it is wrong. And this should be obvious in regard to, to what um, Marshall did and, and Heliobacter. The same thing is true with patients. So when I was a medical student at UK, um, David Clark was a professor of neurology and a, a brilliant, one of the first pediatric neurologists in the country. He said that we can take one fact in each case and throw it out. He didn't mean to not consider it, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't allow the diagnosis, a diagnosis to be denied because something about the patient didn't fit that diagnosis. He said, you can, whatever it is, if you think that they have a peripheral neuropathy and they have a Babinski sign, and the Babinski sign would suggest they don't have a peripheral neuropathy, you shouldn't allow the presence of the Babinski to say they couldn't have a peripheral neuropathy. Maybe this is an over, overly simplistic example, but you need to consider the presence of the Babinski, not just forget it, but allow the fact that no theory fits all the facts in its domain, so that this applies to science and also patients. And in patients, you can consider things and don't expect everything to fit. And uh, I wish I knew this, this quote many years ago when at NIH and elsewhere, I would have ideas and people would say, oh, that's not a good idea because of this and because of this and because of this. And what I should have said is, well, maybe so, maybe not. The fact that there's evidence against something does not mean it's not right. The other great quote from Fire Abend is that the only principle of science that works is anything goes. And uh, I think I will move to a 
favorite thing of mine that irritates me very much, I'm not sure why, excess precision occupies space in your brain which could be better occupied by something important. So putting a BMI in the chart like this, 32.32, this two at the end there on the right is completely meaningless. If you have a, a study that had 58 in group A and 78 in group B, don't tell me that 45.6 of group A were males because that's, that 0.6 is completely meaningless. It's less than one person. So showing irrelevant statistics demonstrates that you don't understand what's happening. I ask, finally, I ask you to consider what do all these gentlemen have in common? Uh, Alexander Fleming, who described molds, uh, penicillin, of course, prisoner for prions and gender for vaccination, uh, cowpox and smallpox, what they all have in common is they weren't first. It's not necessary to be first. It's nice to be first. It's not necessary. So that many, uh, you should consider the fact that being, uh, you can still have contributions to make even if you're not the first. So in conclusion, it's important to think about thinking. Smart people make mistakes. Actually, this happens all the time. No theory fits all the facts in its domain. And the most important thing to pay attention to is the patient, not the biomarkers, not the lab tests, not the MRI scan. And my, my final story would be the neurosurgeon we met in the in the elevator in the hospital many years ago. And my boss, Dr. Bender, said to the neurosurgeon, how's Mr. Jacobson doing? And the neurosurgeon said, oh, I operated on him this morning. He looks good. And we went to see the patient, and he was uh, in coma. What the neurosurgeon meant was that his wound looked good, not his brain. So we need to remember that it's the patient and the patient's outcome and the patient's experience, which is what really matters. Thank you very much, and I'll be pleased to answer your questions. Dr. Friedland. Thank you, Dr. Remmel. I just want to thank you so much for these this amazing mind-expanding talk. I don't really have a question. I would like to hear it three more times <laughs> to, uh, to appreciate the detail. It, it was great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rama. Thank you. Would anybody else like to ask a question or make a comment? So, uh, Dr. Friedland, can you hear me? This is yes. Grant Turek. Hello, Grant. Thank you. Yes. I can hear you. Go ahead, Grant. Hello, Grant. <laughs> Grant? I think he had a problem with his audio. Can Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. My my microphone cut out. I don't. I'm not quite sure what happened there. Okay. Um, so, I, with all this uh, encouragement of deep listening in your talk, I was wondering if you and sorry, if you, with all this encouragement of deep listening in your talk and trying to be a more active listener, I was wondering uh, with residents constantly being pushed to see this patient, see that patient. Uh, you know, you have ten new consults uh, by eight a.m. and you gotta get through that in order to present to the attending, et cetera. Do you have any proposals on how we achieve that as a resident, or is it something to kind of aim at as we go through our training and hopefully attain by attending? Well, that's a good a good question, and I, I, I mentioned that earlier that it gets difficult when you have too many patients to see, and I don't have um, 
uh, part of it is uh, knowing what to ignore. So when you do see the patient, assuming the patient can talk to you, uh, don't be so concerned about things that don't matter. The most important thing I find in my interaction is I want to know what's the main problem? Why are they here? How did it start? How has it changed? Is it getting better or worse? And what made it better? What made it worse? And what is their experience? And if you pay attention to those things more than other things, like um, uh, if you have a lot of patients to see, maybe you can uh, wait, leave the family history till the next day, because it's un not common that the family history is going to be critical to making a decision in there in the emergency room. And uh, uh, certainly rely on, on help from others. But I'm sure you're all expert in that uh, very much. And uh, also, when you get to be in more independent, you need to be ready to fight back so that um, if you're a part of a healthcare system and they're telling you, oh, we, we decided you only have 20 minutes for each new patient, yeah. right? you should just be ready to say, uh, some unspeakable words, which I can't repeat now, you know, but, you know, go so-and-so, go to so-and-so. We can't do that. That's not possible. Uh, and I won't do it. And you need to be able to, to fight back and to uh, support the importance of talking to the patient and paying attention to the patient. Thank you. Um, I also had another follow-up question kind of going along with uh, what Ms. Woodcock said. Not really, as it seems as though she's ready to throw out the patient experience, but did she have any other marker to offer? I didn't read her full statement or anything like that. Yes, yes, I didn't present that completely. What she said was that the amyloid beta protein was cleared from the brain and that should help. And however, there are already 20 studies more than 20 studies that show removing the amyloid beta protein from the brain doesn't help the patient. And uh, even if we didn't have all that evidence already, these studies that have been done of this drug, two, two large studies which cost well over a billion dollars, showed that removing the amyloid in these studies didn't help the patient. But she was so convinced at the theoretical reasoning of the group that is supporting this line of investigation of Alzheimer's disease that she thought that made it worthy of approval because it might help. And because there was great need, so the Alzheimer's Association was pushing them to approve this because there's so many patients and they're suffering so much and there's no effective therapy. And that's all true. But that's not a reason to deny the evidence and to approve something that doesn't work. Thank you. Um, if I have one more minute, I just am. Uh, I love this idea that uh, fishing expeditions may be productive. So, uh, Robert Joint, if any of you knew him, he was a brilliant neurologist at Rochester. He said, people who criticize fishing expeditions have never been fishing. Because actually, when you're fishing, you know exactly what you're doing. You go to a certain place at a certain time and you use a certain method. And it's very guided toward your results. So when the United States sent a mission to Jupiter, it's going to evaluate everything possible. It is still there. And it's debatable whether this could be called a fishing expedition, but I, I think at least some aspect of it is. So we should be open to the, we should be denying the criticism that looking for something 
in regard as a fishing expedition is wrong. At some point, somebody studied the liver for the first time with electron microscopy. They could have been excused, accused of having a fishing expedition, but I'm certain whatever they did was uh, rewarding. So we need to have, be open to the possibility that this is not an appropriate criticism for scientific or clinical uh, investigation. Very nice. Thank you very much, Dr. Friedland. Thank you, Dr. Ramon.